Today we are talking about air pressure. So if you have not seen the previous videos, I would go back and watch air speed and watch aperture control. And I'd also watch the first video, which is all about relieving mouthpiece pressure. So this topic really excites me. I've had a blast the last 25 or however many years it's been since I taught my first trumpet lesson. Um, really focused on understanding this stuff. And way back in the beginning, I didn't understand. It was only until I was about, let me think when that happened, maybe I was like 26 or 27 years old, I finally tied it all together and I could play really uh, without, I could play for a long time without having endurance issues with a really good tone and with a really wide range. And it was at that moment where I became so excited to share this with the world. The problem was back then we didn't have YouTube and when we finally did have YouTube, the cameras were expensive and the resolution was low and the sound was bad. Long story short, I've been teaching master classes and clinics to live audiences and teaching all these techniques and understanding how aperture controlled armature works, um, but it hasn't really been something that's pushed hard on YouTube. So I'm excited to share this one with you. We're talking about air pressure. We are not talking about adding pressure here. We are talking about adding pressure in the airstream. And this is the third piece of the puzzle that we're sharing with you today. Uh, so, thank you for joining me, and I just demonstrated some interesting things that happen on trumpet when you change the air pressure. Now, I want to also stress that I'm changing other things too, like I am changing the aperture size, I am changing the air speed, because all of these things fit together. I can't just change one of them um, because they're tied together. So, when I make my opening really big and open compared to small, then the air pressure changes. If I have a really big opening and I'm blowing a lot of air through it, the air pressure is going to be very low because there's a lot of air volume traveling through the big hole. When I make that hole smaller, it backs up in the chamber, which is my lungs and my body, it backs up in there and it builds up more and more pressure. Now I can change that pressure several different ways. Some people talk about like pushing really hard with your muscles and contracting really hard. Kind of like this, which works, okay? It does work. However, it's maybe not the most versatile um, way of playing trumpet, and I'll explain that here in a minute, uh, because it does work, but it only works for really popping loud notes, okay? That's great, but not every note has to be loud and have that sizzle and brightness. So that wedge type technique works for some things. It's not really going to work for everything unless you take it and slow it down and combine it with all the other pieces of the puzzle, which are really based on your aperture. So when I'm increasing pressure, I create faster air and I do that by having a smaller opening and a, a shorter vibrating surface. My lips are shorter, my aperture is a smaller hole, and my air pressure goes up. What happens then? You have the velocity to create a higher note. And that's the cool thing about brass instruments. There are some really cool exercises that have been shared by great teachers over the years that demonstrate this exact piece of the puzzle without ever seeing it. And I think it's because a lot of times those teachers didn't know the physics equation that was creating the results. They just were such great players and such great teachers that they were teaching the pieces without understanding what they were. Um, and I'm not saying they were naive. They were they understood the whole system. They just didn't explain it in terms of physics. Okay, so I'm gonna do that now. If you notice, I was doing some kind of bends. Can you do that on the trumpet? Can you bend a G down to an F or an E or an E flat? Keep going down. Can you bend the whole scale? So I'm barely locked. 
clocking into the partials. But really, if you were to put a spectrum analyzer up here, you would hear all the notes. C, 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 C. I'm going back and forth between my C's. And I'm hitting every note in between. I'm smearing them without changing the vowels. The faster you do it, the more you can lock in. What am I doing? I'm letting my air pressure drop. So if I want to bend that note down, I, I open things up. I let the airspeed slow down. I open the aperture, which reduces the air pressure. They're all tied together. So try this exercise. changing the air pressure intentionally, I'm not pressing the valves. The first time I press them, just so you can hear it, you can do it on any notes any way you want. There are very famous exercises that do this. And you may go to a high school or a college or something past that, and your teacher may teach you some specific thing like stamp or maggio or any number of things, okay? But they're getting down to these concepts. You're reducing the air pressure and then you're bringing it back up. Why? So you can better understand that that's what's creating the different pitches. So you can master it. If you practice it enough, you'll get really good at it. So if you can bend your pitches down and even up, you're gonna be a better player. It's most easily demonstrated in the lower register because the distance between partials is really wide. The fundamental on a trumpet is pedal C and you're not really gonna hit it very easily. So the C above that is the one below the staff. So there's a full octave between those two partials. And you have a lot of room to bend between them, and that's what I'm doing. So sometimes I will do pedal C or even the C below that, all the way up to double high C, and just mess around with it. This isn't supposed to sound good, it's an exercise in changing the air pressure. It takes a lot of air because there's a big hole and a lot of air is coming out. I want to stress that all of these, these different concepts fit together. They're all pieces of the mechanism that allows you to play any brass instrument. And the three that we have done so far were, if you can remember, recite them now in your own mind. You remember? Okay. First one was aperture, which is related to lip length. Okay. And I'm going to start calling it that, but changing the aperture size or changing the lip length, the vibrating surface. Second was air speed or velocity. Okay, you're changing the speed, you're making it faster as you go higher, which means less air is coming out. And the third one was air pressure. As you're letting less air out and you're closing that uh, aperture, you can add a little back pressure if you need to with your body, it doesn't have to be very much. And then that will increase the air pressure to play higher. And I'm gonna show you, it doesn't have to be a lot. like I'm like adding a ton of pressure? Am I doing this? I'm not doing that. You don't have to do that. Even to play high, you don't have to do that. I do add some, but I'm not forcing my whole body. If you're a physically fit person, you should be able to do this. If you're not, maybe you need to start running, do some cardio, get yourself in shape so you do have a little extra muscle strength because it is the contracting, um, uh, the actual pulling together of your muscles of your entire rib cage that can compress that arm more and it can make it easier to play high, but it doesn't take much effort. It's actually um, very, very moderate. I can't imagine a human being that's normally healthy that can't do it. So it's not a lot of pressure. All right, remember air pressure is an integral part, but you have to have all the other pieces 
I want to see you uh, on the next video. Please put your comments below. I'm sure some of you disagree with this, so please share that as well. Um, not all of you are into science or physics or facts, and I welcome interesting opinions as well. Um, so I do want to point out that I am playing on a summit trumpet that was technically a prototype, and it's got prototype stamped all over the place. If you liked what you heard, this one is called Prototype 52. Um, I'm offering a promo code on this horn. You can save $1,500 on this horn. I'll tell you why I'm offering $1,500 off of this particular horn. Um, it's mainly because this was one of our first experiments, experiments with acoustic armor. And there is a layer of acoustic armor underneath the black. And some of it isn't quite even, so it's a little choppy in places. It's not perfect. And this horn was sold in 2017, so about two years ago. It was played for two years. Even though it's in really good condition, there are little nicks and scratches and things. And uh, I'm sure that at the reduced pricing and a $1,500 discount, you're going to get an amazing horn that you wouldn't get anywhere else. It plays amazing. You can always trade it back in and get your full credit towards a new horn down the road. And uh, it's going to be a good deal for you. So that's the HT52. I should also mention on that horn, it has lead pipe 2 Bell 11, and it does have the Venturi gap receiver system, which I'll pull that receiver off right now so you can see it. So we can take the receiver off, change these inserts, adjust flexibility, slotting, and airflow. And that is a very important part of brass plane. I invented that and everything else on our horns to coincide with the physics of the instruments. So the way that we play them is more important than the instrument itself, but a great instrument is going to take you further. All right, I'll see you next time on the next video discussing how we can embrace the aperture controlled embouchure and how we can alleviate that mouthpiece pressure problem. All right, have a great day.